Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ryan Zimler, and I'm the Mandel School intern for the conference. Uh, some of you have gotten my emails. Thank you for being so kind to me. Uh, I would at this time like to invite our afternoon panelists up. And while I do that, just to give you a, a brief um, look into the reason that we're doing this, at this time we're gonna have representatives of, of local uh, philanthropy groups coming in and answering some questions about the work that's being done here in Cleveland and in Cuyahoga County. Um, I'm gonna start with our moderator who will introduce our presenters. Uh, Carrie Miller from the Foundation Center. As the regional training specialist for the Foundation Center Cleveland's Library, Carrie connects members of the community with resources of the Foundation Center and information on how to increase their organization's capacity to deliver services to the community. Prior to joining the Foundation Center, Carrie was the program director for the City Club of Cleveland for over five years, planning their diverse year-long public forum series. Carrie has served on the Neighborhood Connections Grant-Making Committee for four years and has been a partner for Social Venture Partners Cleveland for five years. She also serves on the Advisory Committee for Brews and Pros, a monthly reading series in Ohio City, and on the Board of Directors of Equality Ohio. Without further ado, Carrie Miller. Thank you, and thank you all <clears throat> for attending today and for the work that you do. I'm really excited that this conversation is happening. We at the Foundation Center like to consider ourselves as being seated at the intersection of philanthropy and the nonprofit sector and bringing together those two sectors to make sure everybody's getting the resources they need to do the important work in the community. Um, I was in a session earlier this morning that talked about building synergy in the community, and this is a great opportunity to use their, the terms I heard this morning to connect the grass tops to the grassroots and make sure that we all are, are talking to each other. Um, philanthropy literally means the love of people, which means we're all doing the same work and we all have the same mission. For the people next to me, their love of people manifests itself in their work to contribute financial support to the nonprofit and non-governmental organizations which aim to serve the public good and improve the quality of life of humans, which is what we're all doing. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our panel and get right into it. Uh, I'll ask a couple questions, but then I think we have time for questions from the audience. So hopefully we can have a great dialogue. Um, Leah Gary, all the way to my left is the president and CEO of the William J. and Dorothy K. O'Neill Foundation. Prior to this position, she served as the vice president for program and evaluation at the St. Luke's Foundation. Leah is a registered nurse and is a member of the visiting committee of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing and the Cleveland State University Foundation Board of Trustees, or just the university, foundation. No, foundation, yeah. Um, Susanna Cray, over here on my right, is the Senior Vice President for Foundations, Outreach Ministries, and External Affairs at the Sisters of Charity Health System. She's been serving as the President of the Sisters of Charity Foundation since 2004. In this role, she is helping to carry out the more than 160-year commitment of the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine's mission to improve the lives of the poor and underserved. Nancy Mendez, here at my close left, is the Director of Community Impact Operations for the United Way. She started her tenure with the United Way in 2009 as the Program Director for Aging and Special Needs. Prior to joining the United Way, she served as the Program Director for the Center for Minority Public Health of Case Western Reserve University. And over here, on, all the way on my right, is Christy Andrasik. Christy is a program officer for the Cleveland Foundation in responsive grant making. Christy previously worked at the Cleveland Metropolitan School District's Office of Family and Community Engagement and the Goodrich Gannett Neighborhood Center in Cleveland. She received her uh, Master's of Science in Social Administration from Case Western Reserve University. So now we got all the formalities out of the way and we'll get down to business. Um, I want to take an opportunity to start with everybody having an opportunity to discuss what human services means in their organizations. Um, and I would like to start with Leah Gary, who um, recently the O'Neill Foundation made a fairly dramatic shift in their funding priorities. And would, I'd like you to talk about those, that shift, what prompted that change, and what that has now meant for the foundation. run anything, right? 
Um, first, thank you for inviting me to be here. As a nurse, I'm kindred spirit with you. My uh, career has passed and worked with all of you every step of the way, so it's really an honor to be asked to be here. And to talk a little bit about the foundation for which I work today, the William J. and Dorothy K. O'Neill Foundation is a family foundation. Uh, William J. and Dorothy K. were prominent O'Neills here in uh, Cleveland, and they are family originally owned Leaseway Trucking, which is the origin of the funding for the foundation. And originally uh, was run by a member of the family, and I'm the first non-family member to be there. And um, I have a colleague here from St. Luke's Foundation today who, it's been 10 years since I left the St. Luke's Foundation and went to O'Neill, so I've been there a very long time. When I got there, the priorities of the foundation were to fund projects that the family members were interested in and only those. And over time, the family uh, undertook a generation switch. So the uh, founding and the generation has stepped away from the table and their children, who are 40 and 50 somethings, have come onto the board and taken the reins and actually went through a strategic planning process where they determined that our mission and vision would be to serve families. Since uh, William and Dorothy founded the foundation to keep their family together in their philanthropic work, our board decided that working directly for families was going to be our priority. So our vision is for strong families in communities where they can and thrive, and our mission is to work with nonprofit partners to serve and strengthen families. It was a very deliberate conversation among, there are 93 O'Neills in the William and Dorothy family, from babies to 86, and literally even the littlest ones uh, who were around at the time of our strategic planning drew pictures of what they wanted to fund. And they included families with animals, horses and dogs primarily. So we do a little bit of that. We do a little bit of that. But by and large, our fund funding is primarily focused on organizations that work with families as the unit of operation, the primary unit, um, delivering services to strengthen them. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nancy Mendez, and I work at United Way. And we recently also uh, shifted, restructured, um, and moved towards educa education, income, and health. And I have to say, social workers uh, play a huge part in that. In our shift, we also shifted towards prevention. Um, we shifted upstream. We shifted towards helping families and identify root causes for cycles of poverty, cycles of, of um, bad health and chronic disease, to help families identify why um, fam uh, children aren't graduating. Um, and I, in identifying that, then there's some work that has to happen on the individual level, and that is where all of you come in. Um, so there, there's one thing that uh, if a family is broken, if a family has substance abuse issues, if a family, um, uh, the parents cannot find jobs, um, if there was some past abuse or anger management issues, again, that's where you come in. Um, so you play a huge role in our shift at United Way. Uh, hopefully, I, I recognize many of the faces out there, and um, we view you as our partners um, and, uh, cont and, and really look forward to continuing to work with all of you. glasses just slipped off my head. You know, it's such a thrill to be here this afternoon, and um, I just want to personally just thank each and every one of you for what you do with your heart and hands as to how you touch the lives of those that you serve. Um, from us as a faith-based organization, there's no greater gift that you can give to people than what each of you do and how you touch their lives. And, and I just want to digress for just a moment to say one of my mentors was one of the most phenomenal social workers, was Sister Mary Patricia Barrett. If anybody happens to know her from the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine, who just recently passed away two days ago. And she was such a zealot around touching people's lives and recognizing the gifts that social workers have. So, so you folks are really important. So from our foundation, I've already sort of given you some hints that our foundation was founded by a religious order of sisters. So we are a faith-based organization. And at the time that this organization was founded back in 1996, the Sisters of Charity Foundation, you know, the sisters said, you know, there are so many different programs in the community that touch lives and serve, the, serve those who are underserved and who are economically poor, is there a way that we could put these funds in service in the community to kind of get at the root causes of that or to try to drive at systems change 
to make a difference to really enhance the quality of life of those who live in the economic, who, who are materially poor. And so it was from that point of view, and I used just two quick metaphors. It was the example that often was thrown to us is, you know, the little boy who's at the seashore and there are thousands of starfish and he takes one in and he throws it into the ocean. He's picking them up and throwing them in one by one. And, and, and an elderly gentleman comes back and says, little boy, what are you doing that for? Don't you see all of them? And, he, and what difference are you making? And the little boy says, well, that makes a difference to that one, you know, that I threw it in. So that really it, it demonstrates the importance of doing the direct service work. So we fund that to a certain extent, but we also use a different metaphor where the sisters wanted us to put more of our funding in. So we've spent about 80% of our funding in this space, which is the metaphor of the babies coming down the river, right? And somebody's, the villagers are pulling out the babies and someone says, why don't we go up, up the river and see who's throwing these babies in? What are they doing coming down the river? And so that's what we call a systems change, try to get at the root causes. And so in that regard, we've picked four different areas that we've really focused in. Ending homelessness has been a very long, standing piece of work that we've been focused in and driving at systems change for chronic homeless folks, family homelessness, as well as young people who are experiencing homelessness. And one of the attributes from the sisters' point of view is that we want to have a long-standing stick to itiveness So we've been at that since the late 90s in terms of how we've been working in homelessness. And so another one is addressing uh, health disparities, educational disparities with a certain geographic focus, so we do a lot in the central neighborhood. And then lastly, because the population of women religious sisters who really work with those who are economically poor, that is a movement that's dying out in this country. And so we wanna continue to think about how to sustain that work and the many qualities and attributes around how they carried out and touched the lives of those who were most in need. So thank you. Okay. Hi, so I'm, I'm Christy, I'm from the Cleveland Foundation and um, I am an LISW, so I am here among my people and happy to be here. <laughs> Um, the Cleveland Foundation is a community foundation, and we are actually the very first community foundation in the entire world. So that's something that Cleveland can be really proud of, right? And what a Cleveland or what a community foundation is, is unlike um, a private foundation or a family foundation, we're actually a collection of uh, funds and donations from the community. So anybody can contribute to the Cleveland Foundation, and then we're responsible publicly for how those dollars are then put back into our community for the public good. So our, our board is made up of folks that represent our community as well so that we can make those decisions in the best interest of our community. So I think that's something that Cleveland can really be proud of. We have this history of really taking care of each other. Um, and that's what social, worker, social, social work is all about as well. So I am in the community responsive department in the Cleveland Foundation. We're a pretty big operation. So we do have a couple um, board directed strategies that are very specific long term strategies that work in uh, areas such as education, economic development, um, youth development, et cetera. And then our community responsive department that I work in is where we are responding to the community. So you tell us what the definition is of what the needs are, what are the trends, what's going on, and we work to support the, the community in that way. So our definition of, of human services and, and human needs is, is very broad. And it's, it's all of those many things that go into making our community a place that has equitable access for folks to, to live their lives and live their lives in a full and um, fulfilling way. Thank you all. That's a variety of different things. We have a, a saying at the Foundation Center, when you've met one foundation, you've met one foundation. So um, it's great to hear the different perspective from the different types of funding organizations as well as the different types of work that you do. But one of the things that I did notice that was a theme amongst most of these comments was the term partnership. And I would, it would be great to get an understanding of what partnership means to your foundations and how you work to, with your funding, your fundees, to build partnership in the in delivery of service. You can start over here this time. Now that I just got the microphone back. All right, you're gonna have to tear it away from me after this. So partnership is something that is, is really important and I think um, having been on the other side of the table longer than I've been in philanthropy, I've been in nonprofits longer than I've been in philanthropy, 
I can say that I know what it sounds like when a foundation says, we're your partner, and you're like, yeah, uh-huh, sure you are. You've got the money, we're doing the work. Partners. Um, <laughs> but I can, I can tell you that for the most part, foundations really do wanna be a partner, and if we allow it to happen, it can be something that really is meaningful. So I take it very seriously in my role in, is a program officer for community responsive that we that I really am one of the folks that's the access to the foundation so engaging with the community and understanding what's going on in your organizations is very important to me and funding is extremely an extremely important resource that we offer but it's certainly not the only resource I know what it's like to be in an organization and you do the job every day and that's what you do that's what you focus on you have to make sure that the folks that you're taking care of are taken care of that your organization is is opening its doors every day and it can be hard to get that sort of big picture bird's eye view and then you hear a foundation saying collaborate collaborate and you're like sure so that's where you can really look to a foundation to be your partner and say I'd love to collaborate but I'm really engaged in what I need to do in my organization every day. So do you have some, some thoughts on what collaboration might look like? Do you have some, some technical assistance, some advice for me? And for the most part, foundations are gonna be very interested in helping you with that. Foundations are gonna wanna engage with you truly as a partner in that work in that way. And there may be some other resources, some connections um, that can be provided for you. Thank you, Christy. You know, partnership is really important to us in so many different ways. Um, because of our very focused areas that we fund in, we, we really develop very close relationships with those organizations that are helping us to achieve that goal of either ending homelessness or reduce or creating healthy eating, active living in the central neighborhood. And so we partner with them in a very deep way. Beyond a grant, it might be, you know what, where we've learned about some really important um, evidence-based models in some other place. And so we'll say, well, can we help get you there so you can learn about that and maybe bring it back? So we might partner in that way. Um, beyond the technical assistance that, um, that um, Christy spoke of, we might even think about ways in, in saying, you know, um, lots of different ideas of how to address issues. We might help with capacity building sometimes. A, gr a grantee will come forward and say, you know, we would, it would really help us if we had a consultant and we don't have time to put a whole grant to help address this. Well, okay, so let's talk about what that scope of work is. How can we help you? How can we find? So we really are looking at different ways of trying to say, in the end, we want to be aligned in our mission of what we're trying to achieve and we want to really work together to solve that and so we hope that we are very approachable very much let's talk through issues so it's not that it has to be you know you can talk about things but don't talk about it in front of us because we, get, we want to understand we want to be very transparent to each other we want to be transparent to say how much money we can put into this how, what are your needs as to how we can achieve those objectives so partnership is really a very important part to us and we want to listen to our partners in a deep way and we also want our partners to also collaborate with others because so many of the issues we face, just one organization can't address it. There's expertise in many other organizations that if we can figure out how to integrate that together and figure out the synergies of different organizations, we can be much stronger. I mean, clearly the collaboration that's come together around ending chronic homelessness is so strong and they draw from all the different expertise and there's a lead agency, Enterprise Community Partners, that is sort of the backbone agency around that collaboration. And over the 10 years, they've been able to drop chronic homelessness by 73% of this community. They lead the nation in what they've been able to achieve. So partnership and collaboration in a very deep way is very important to us. And perhaps um, the last piece I will say is we as a funder like to collaborate with other funders too because that's important also, because sometimes if there's another funder that really would like some other funders to come along, we want to be able to share and partner with those. And so we understand what collaboration is too, as we ask our grantees to also participate in collaboration. Thank you. 
I'm just going to move up a little bit because I, I feel like I'm hiding from half of you. Hi, everybody, over on that side. Um, ditto to everything that um, the two panelists have already brought up about partnership. Completely agree with that. Um, without our partners, uh, without the, the organizations, we can't make the work, the outcome, the impact happen. Um, so it has to be a dialogue. Um, it has to be constant communication where uh, we're ask, we ask of you, but we also meet with you consistently so that you, we can hear back from you what you need from us um, as funders, as partners, as collaborators. Um, I'll give you an, an example of one of our great partnerships, which is our wraparound programs. Um, if many of you haven't heard, uh, we are in a partnership with CMSD and many of you in this room um, to wrap services around schools and children. And, and my colleagues up here are also involved in similar work in, in other neighborhoods. We can't make that happen without the organizations coming together and bringing their services around the school, wrapping around services around the child and their family. Um, so again, you are the vehicle to change. Uh, we can um, come up with these brilliant models and um, new ideas that we think um, are gonna change the community, but and then we have to turn to you um, and, 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 and work with you to be able to make that happen. So again, um, it, we're just one piece of the puzzle um, and partnership is constantly communi communicating with you in the community did we hit the right mark? Does this make sense? Is this realistic? Um, this model that we've heard from in, in California and we wanna bring to Cleveland, will it work here? If not, why not? Um, we, we are not gonna know that in, in um, our building or you know, in our, amongst our, our circle. We need to reach out to you um, to really understand um, the full impact of the work or possibilities of the work. Um, and lastly, uh, I would say that partnership, um, your, the partnership with you is so important because you're the voice of the community too. Um, a lot of times we, we do try to reach out to the community, but you're in the front lines um, and uh, you're kind of the compass for many of the funders and the volunteers that do this work. You help guide the work. Um, you keep your, your um, uh, finger on uh, the pulse of the community. Um, so the partnership, the work with you is extremely important. Thank you. Um, Partnership is a word that means two-way street, right? Uh, one partner gives something and the other partner gives something as well. And I think um, when foundations talk about partnering with you, um, it's often an, uh, an imbalance of power because the foundation sits with the money and you need it, right? That, that's the fundamental, um, I sort of hit inside baseball, fundamentally if you don't ask me for money, I can't do my job. So please, that's the nature of our relationship is that you approach and, and work with us. Um, we have a mission to make families stronger, but the fact of the matter is I don't work with any families beyond the O'Neills, I don't, and my own, I don't work with any families in my daily nine to five job, you guys do, so I need to understand your work, I need to fund your work to make my mission and vision ha happen. So, so that means the partnership is that you come to me or to my foundation with a request that you th you've done your due diligence, you've actually read my website, please do that first, and found out that we wanna work with families, and you come to me with an idea you think will work. It's my responsibility in that partnership to work hard to help you understand how that idea can flesh with what I know I can get funded and what I know the family will respond to. And if the original idea isn't quite right, it's my responsibility to help you get an idea that will get the work done that you need to get done and that I can get funded. Now I want to make sure that you hear what I said. I didn't say you come to me with the idea I want to hear and you go do what I want you to do and then I'll fund you. Never that. And if that's what you're trying to do, don't use that funder. Go to a new, different funder who understands the work you wish to do. So I, I am willing to work, in, and my staff and I, in partnership. It may take two, three, four attempts before we get somebody funded, but we're willing to work in that partner arrangement. Tell you what's wrong. Tell you why we don't think it'll work in our boardroom, what and, and how things need to be uh, adjusted if we can help you. And if we can't, if we're not the right funder, we'll tell you that up front, we'll never invite a proposal that we know we can't get funded or that doesn't have a live shot because your time is way too valuable. Um, and you're actually the ones taking care of the families we need to have taken care of. So for us, partnership is very practical. 
we have a relationship with you, we have money, and we need to give it to you. And you need to figure out how to bring a project to us with impact that our board can resonate with. So th that's, for us, partnership is very self-serving on both sides. Um, <clears throat> to make sure that our mission and vision is realized and to make sure that you're doing the good work that we need the community to have happen. I heard it said very well yesterday that the, the nonprofits need the foundations to help execute on their mission, but the, the foundations need nonprofits to help execute on their missions oh, as well. If, if I could just, um, I need to hire you to make my mission happen. I mean, that's essentially what it is, because I don't care for families. I sit in an office in Brooklyn, Ohio, five days a week at a computer while you guys are out there doing the work. So you absolutely have to get a grant from me or I can't make that mission happen. One of the other themes that I heard in the opening statements was about um, getting to the root issues, about advocacy, and about addressing, uh, uh, Nancy, I think you said swimming upstream, so that speaks to prevention a little bit. So it would be great to, um, before we get to the audience questions, which will be next, so please get your questions ready. Um, I do believe you'll come up to the microphone over here, but um, it would be great to hear about how your organizations and foundations view advocacy and view that prevention work and what that means to, to the work that you do. We can start wherever. Nancy, let's start with sure. you since mix it up. I think advocacy is at the center point of breaking the cycle of poverty. Um, there are so many areas where that only change in public policy, change in systems, will eventually start breaking those cycles. Um, and in, that, in, in, in thinking of it that way, we need to work, again, with that word partners, it's, so, it's, it's very important. We need to work with you in identifying those policies that need to change and working with you and, and bringing those voices together to go to Columbus, to go to the national level and change those policies. So for us at, at United Way and, and the volunteers that work with us, and there's a couple of you out there, thank you for all your work. It is crucial that we identify the root causes of the cycle of poverty, identify policies, changes and systems that can be made to break those cycles and bring people together to make it happen. It's that simple. Advocacy around um, what Nancy just said for us is really, really critical. And for us, advocacy starts with authentic listening and deep listening because part of being really effective as an advocate is to have the first-hand knowledge of what the end beneficiaries, the people who are actually affected by the issues, what their perspective is on it, how they feel about it, what their barriers are, what their challenges are. And I really feel that it is, um, and so our foundation spends a lot of time in focus groups really listening to end users to understand their perspective. We also really want our grantees to always, when they come to us, to understand how they are checking and listening to the end user that they're serving. So having that firsthand knowledge is really important to be an advocate. Then the second um, aspect that I would say about the importance of advocacy for us in terms of systems change is, to, is from time to time to fund research. Because there are times when you collect the data around an issue, you can then elevate it when you go to Columbus or when you go to the city or other places to say, look, here's the data on this. We need to address this. This can't continue to be in this manner and to continue to raise it up. because. Not that data says everything, but data tied with the really authentic listening and the stories of those who are impacted by the issues, I think is really very powerful to ultimately make policy change. So I think that policy and advocacy stuff can feel a little bit daunting for social workers. I know that it has for me for many times. I can remember even being in social work school and you have to fill out your evaluation of your internship and you're filling in all of these different areas that you, that you you know, worked in, in your internship, and one of them was always advocacy, and was like, how do I do advocacy when my job every day was literally working one-on-one -on -one with clients with mental health issues, or doing, you know, uh, substance abuse assessments, or doing case management? 
I don't have time for advocacy. And, and I think it can feel like this anxiety provoking thing that that's, that's, that's that other thing that someone else is working on, right? Someone else is going to Columbus, someone else is doing the advocacy piece. We need to do what we need to do to take care of the people that are in front of us right here and right now. But I think over time, what I've come to see as advocacy is that it has a much broader definition and that what you do every day, when you're intentional about it, it is advocacy. Because it doesn't have to just be the policy piece, although that's extremely important. But the storytelling that Susanna mentioned, storytelling is advocacy. Illuminating the reality of the landscape of what your clients are working with, what your neighborhoods are dealing with, illuminating that landscape and telling that story is advocacy. That's how we start to change institutionalized oppression, institutionalized racism, institutionalized sexism, institutionalized discrimination against LGBT people, is that we have to tell the stories of what's really going on. And you have to do it in spaces that aren't comfortable. You have to do it, you have to talk to your board. You have to talk to your friends and your family and your church and your social groups. You have to do that, and that is truly advocacy because it doesn't just relegate your clients' issues to the work you're doing at your job, but you're saying that this is human issues and that this is how we advocate for each other as a community. And that's also a place where as a partner with your funders, you can ask for some help and say, we have stories, we have a vision and a view of the trends of things that are happening, but we're not sending someone to Columbus or to DC for policy work, do you know who is? Because we might be able to at least provide them some of that information so that they're advocating for the right things. And that's where you can get a little bit of assistance in, in at least being able to connect up in those ways. Nobody has any questions? Amy, you want to, do you want to come to the microphone? <laughs> If you if you're thinking of your questions now, you can you can come up to the microphone and ask your questions. After that great question, um, and I know that John Corlett, who gave the morning keynote address um, and runs Center for Community Solutions, and we at Policy Matters Ohio, which is a nonprofit policy research and advocacy group funded by some of these generous funders up on the um, podium here, are very, very happy to have you come to us with your stories, with the problems that you are seeing in the community, with the solutions that you're seeing in the community. We can help you turn that into policy change, and I know that John and his folks can too, so thanks. Oh, go ahead. So the comment was about helping clients to advocate for themselves. So thank you for that, yeah. Um, I'll, just as a follow-up to that, um, at a site visit, and uh, we site visit every request that we're considering prior to funding it, so we get to know you deeply before we make the decision. I love it when clients are at the site visits to tell me their own story. I just love that. It's my favorite part of my job. Carrie, I have a question over here. Oh, great. Hi, my name is Brenda Riley, and I work for Children and Family Services. But prior to uh, my stint right now in child welfare, I worked in higher education at colleges and universities. One of the disconnects that I see, and we have an initiative with our agency, as many of you know, with connecting children and families to early education, to early um, preschool and Head Start programs. But one of the major disconnects, as I listened this morning to the presenters, is in our region is really poverty and systemic poverty. And one of the other disconnects is the education. We have to work with our families and our communities to get them to understand that they have to stay in school. They have to finish high school. They have to then look to get a credential even beyond high school folks. There are a lot of unfilled jobs in Northeast Ohio. We have to have a trained workforce to get to those jobs. There are jobs in Tool and Die. We know also that healthcare is booming. We know that we need doctors and nurses, but there are also so many other jobs in, in um, healthcare arena that only require maybe a two-year degree or a certificate uh, beyond the high school level to get to the systemic issues with poverty. We also, some of the data in Northeast Ohio, um, you know, just we don't have a high uh, degree of, a high rate of degree attainment either. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. 
while I agree that education is crucial, it's one of our pillars, education, income, and health, I think that we also have to understand why so many of our folks in, in greater Cleveland are not graduating. Why are these children failing? It's usually not because the parents are not interested. It's not because we don't have brilliant students in these schools. So why are we struggling so hard to graduate our children, much less even send them to college? That's where uh, many of us kept uh, bringing up upstream prevention, root causes. If we truly wanna figure out how we're gonna increase graduation rates, we gotta figure out why these kids are going to school unprepared and always there's this huge achievement gap between kids living in the suburbs and kids living in inner cities and in poverty. And with that, you're gonna find all those issues um, of not having utilities on half the school year, whether it's the water, the heat, um, not having food at the table, watching your parents fighting or one of them or both of them out of work, um, some trauma in other ways that you're, you're experiencing, the path you walk to school, always uh, experiencing violence or the threat of violence. Then we expect them to just magically go into a classroom and succeed. That's not gonna happen. So we have to get to the root causes so that we truly get an understanding of why kids that are just by the very fact of born in certain neighborhoods are at a disadvantage in school and then get together, partner, fund, innovate so that we could figure out how to get these brilliant minds into these great jobs. I just want to add to what Nancy has said. You know, many, uh, many of you may be aware that the Sisters of Charity Foundation is the lead agency that is trying to bring a promised neighborhood, the Cleveland Central promised neighborhood in the, in the central neighborhood. And we work in deep partnership with CMSD in trying to really promote opportunities for the children and families in the three elementary schools, K through eight, that exist. And you know, most recently, we, again, we always look very closely at data because it really informs what we do. 50, the chronic absenteeism of the children in those three schools is 57%. So one of the aspects that we've been working on is, and it gets back to the empowerment point that this lady mentioned, is we have worked with a resident leadership program with residents in the community. We call them the Promise Ambassadors. And so they, with teachers and principals, knocked on doors, canvassed on doors, and we're collecting the data of what are the issues, what are the challenges. And one by one, we're trying to think of, we're trying to, just as Nancy said, get under the root causes of what some of the challenges are as to why there's such a disconnect just even in the chronic absenteeism space. And you know, we're finding lots of issues as she mentioned, like one that surprised CMSD. Many kids couldn't come to school, they were suspended. So we looked at, well, so what are the suspension policies? And is there any flexibility around making that different so that kids are in school as opposed to not being able to go to school? And, and you know, she already mentioned about safety and trauma and the many of the other issues that we experience. So it really is Im important to, um, to your point, but we've got to really, to your point about the importance of getting degrees, but we've got to figure out what's broken that's not getting our kids through the school system and through having opportunities for a quality education also. We have another question over here. As someone who's on the ground every day in Garden Valley, we are feeding over 10,000 people a month out of our program. We're educating in construction, we're educating in home health care, and we don't charge our clients for these services. We're paying for it out of our pockets. Because see, most funders look at established and proven programs already, rather than upstarts, or rather than uh, demonstration projects. And yet these new operations, Garden Valley, Though it has been around a long time, it's been under new management for the last five years. I've talked to someone in each group up here except the O'Neill Foundation, and we have not been able to make progress. So we pay between forty dollars and $50,000 out of our pocket to make this work. But I want to say this that our approach is a holistic approach. You can't look at just one aspect of an individual 
or a family and say this is the problem. We start with food because if your stomach is growling, you don't care about anything else. You have to feed and then around that program, we have developed over 45 programs and services that initiated from the community. We do a survey, we ask what is it that you need? We don't presume to know what our clients need. We go directly to them and we ask them on a monthly basis what are your needs? And then we work with people in the community to develop a response to that need. And because of that, we have not had a program that has failed yet. And I just need to say that, that there must be an opportunity for new agencies and organizations to have access to funding. Because sometimes it's not about the numbers, it's about the quality of the output. Okay. Okay. We have a, Chris, hey. we have a response from Chris. Well, right can, I, can I respond since I got called out? Yes. <laughs> I, did, we, did we speak? Did you speak with me or did you speak I with us? No, not, oh, okay. not the O'Neill right. Foundation. Call me <laughs> up. Call me up. And let, let me just say something about startup funding. Because startup funding is both the most exciting and the very hardest for a foundation to do. And here's, it's very exciting because you heard the passion, right? I mean, who's, how do you argue with that? I mean, you, you swept me up, I'll get my checkbook out. <laughs> But, but the other problem that, that you have to understand inside my shop is that I'm going to have somebody on a board ask me about measurable outcomes. So maybe what I can help you with is not necessarily that first operating money, but maybe I can help you build the infrastructure to get those measurable outcomes. Because that's one of the things that you guys are busy taking care of, folks. You don't, a measurable outcomes, are you kidding? I got people to find a bed for, or I've got somebody to feed. But you, in order for you to help me get that argument made inside a boardroom, I'm going to have that question asked. And I'm, if I can't answer it, I can't fund it. I'm just, that's just the reality inside the boardroom in which I work. So coming, perhaps there's a first grant that can be made to help build and help you understand what those outcomes are. Because making sure your programs have the quality you suspect they have so you can demonstrate, tweak, and change and make them even better makes them not just appealing to O'Neill, but makes them appealing to the Sisters of Charity, Cleveland Foundation, St. Luke's, Mount Sinai, and on and on because you've got some measurable uh, data. Sue says she doesn't make a decision without data, and she's right. So come and talk to me, and maybe there's a way we can help you that's different than um, a first operating grant. Connections made right okay. here. Wow. So I, okay. I'd, like, I'd like to just respond to that yeah. as well and just say that right there, that was advocacy. That is advocacy. That is advocacy because sometimes it feels like you come and you get the answer no for your grant. You come again, you get the answer no for your grant. But you are advocating because you are illuminating the subject matter. You're bringing it to the attention of funders. You're bringing it to the attention of decision makers. That is something that social workers absolutely can do as advocacy. So I appreciate that and it takes bravery. And I know it also takes working around the clock to, to do that. Um, and I would say that for organizations that are doing your kind of work and that are doing it all volunteer and, and need some of those startup funds, there is one small option. And the Foundation Center is definitely the first stop that can help there. find some of I those great there. options for sure. Um, Neighborhood Connections is also a, a small grant that works very much with um, grassroots and startup things. Um, and as, as Leah said, some of the issues are not that fund, foundations don't want to fund startups or don't want to fund organizations, but that we have folks that we have to answer to and what they're looking for. But when you give us the words that we can then use to advocate up the chain, sometimes that is what takes time and time and time, but will make an, an, an impact. It will. Yeah. Thank you. One, yeah, one I, I think, uh, just let me follow up on that, because your best advocate at a foundation is a well-informed program officer. So they can tell your story, and, and, and that's exactly how uh, well, today, I'm, I'm your program officer. I act as a program officer at our place. There's only three of us working there. So today, you have helped me understand what's going on in Garden Valley better than I did before. And I thought I knew what was going on in that neighborhood because I spend a lot of time making grants in other places in that neighborhood. So thank you. 
Yeah. I just want to add one comment to that. The Sisters of Charity Foundation does have a basic needs grant making program, and we do entertain gr um, grants from both um, grassroots startup organizations as well as more sophisticated organizations. And it's all about providing basic needs. And in fact, we are also even in the business through that program of helping with transportation, bus tickets and that, just because that has come up to be a, a need. And we've, we've, we do a deal with the RTA so we can help lots of nonprofits who need bus tickets for their clients. And so I just check out our website about that. One more, one more comment. And I just wanted also to add that at United Way, we have um, a smaller pots of money that we use for innovation. Uh, we used to fund one time a pilot program demonstration um, so that then you have the opportunity to build out outcomes so that then you could leverage that pilot demonstration and go out and say, look, United Way funded us for a year. This is what we are we able to show you. And then you can go out to the other foundations and um, leverage that pilot program to then seek funding. So it's a smaller pot, but we take very seriously um, um, uh, funding innovation, uh, funding demonstrations, so that then you can move forward and ask for bigger dollars down the road. I think this may okay. be our last our time for one more. Yes, my name is Janice Williams. I'm a former social worker with Cleveland Metropolitan Schools, and I say former because November 4th was my last day. When you all were mentioning all the social ills that are interfering with the progress of our students, there is a solution, there was a solution, there's never been a total number of social workers to address that. As a school social worker for the past 17 years, Every issue you address and 20 more we dealt with and we always had small numbers. We never were able to cover all the needs. Um, there's a very esteemed person in this room who could speak to that. How there were times when we had 15, 20 schools and we were on crisis. So my point is that we don't really need to scratch our heads about why these kids are having the problems they're having. We know why they're having. It's multi-layered. It's not rocket science, but the point is we need some bodies, and I'll say more than one, in every school building. And this is not just Cleveland. This works for East Cleveland, Brush, Parma. This is a, a culture issue that we're dealing with, with poverty, with abuse, with neglect. And you need point people in the building where that's their total job. Not giving the teachers extra duties, not putting it on the guidance counselors. You need troubleshooters. We know it works. So what I've been told today is that it, in particular with Cleveland, they're going to a budget model and each principal will be able to choose. But here's the problem. Principals have to make a lot of decisions. So if they have to choose between a teacher and a social worker and they've got to get that park test, who do you think they're going to choose? I'm just being realistic. What we need is tremendous support from those of you with money. Put social workers back in the schools in teams. Thank so, you. I want to I want to use that as an opportunity to get some last statements from our funders and before I do that I am gonna, I am going to put in a plug for the Foundation Center Library. We're located in the 16th floor of the Hanna Building and if you have never applied for a grant before, if you've applied for several, we have programs and services that can help you do your job better. We've got information about what each of the funders up here is looking for so you can do your research on these funders before you approach them. We have trainings on how to write grant proposals, how to write budgets, how to do all of it. So please check out the Foundation Center calendar. Um, that being said, um, one of the other questions that we get a lot at the Foundation Center, and I'd like to use, use that example as an opportunity to ask each of the funders on the table in your final statements, how do people in the room approach you? And how do you, what is the venue by which pe these, this group of people can tell their stories to you and to other funders in the community to make sure that their, their voices get heard? Anybody want to start? I'll be happy to start. Um, first thing, read the website. Then call me up on the telephone and let's find a time to talk. Give, um, uh, this relationship is, this uh, passage of money from me to you is based on relationships of me knowing you and you knowing me. It's all about relationships. So calm us up. I agree with that. Um, communication, call us up, meet with us. I love Starbucks. Um, and we'll be more than happy to sit, sit down with you. 
oh yes, and we'll, we'll pay. pay. Uh, <laughs> yes, but uh, it's all about communication and hearing your story, um, and hearing your thoughts, um, hearing your ideas. So, so call us up, uh, meet with us. Uh, there's plenty of staff at, at United Way, a couple of them are here, um, and they're, they're dynamic, they're wonderful, and they're great listeners. Just reach out to us. I would, I, would say that, I would say the same, but I would describe our foundation because of the goals that we seek um, to accomplish. We sort of describe ourselves as not really an open foundation in the sense that we don't have regular cycles and, and it's a matter of if you study what we do and or have questions on what we do, we're very open to contact us and to learn more about what we do. But as you learn what we do, you might say, hey, I really, understand what they're doing and we have ideas to really partner together, work together, email us, call <coughs> us, talk to the program officers, we welcome that because we oftentimes send out RFPs and that is really a request for proposal and we always want to say in that that we do not understand what the solutions are or how to address it. We welcome to hear back of what the ideas, what the issues are to, to problem solve the solutions, the issues that we may bring forward. So email us, reach out to our program officers, reach out to me, and uh, there's almost never a time when I don't respond to someone and say, yes, let's, let's get together and talk. So at the Cleveland Foundation, um, we have a, a two-step process. You would just go on our website and look for apply for a grant and you set up a profile about your organization and then you submit an inquiry, which just basically gives an overview of the program that you're requesting funding for, um, just a, a really brief description. You then get a response approximately two weeks um, after that as to whether or not you've been invited for a full, pro a full proposal. And that just kind of saves you the time from going through the whole shebang of writing the whole big long thing and submitting a zillion documents if it's not looking like it's gonna be a fit. My most important suggestion that I can leave with you is if you submit an inquiry that gets declined, don't just take it at that. Call and ask why and be open to hearing why. Program officers are very willing to talk with you about why it was a decline. And sometimes that decline is a decline for now, but now we're a little bit more aware of your organization and there may be some things that if this shifts or that shifts next year or next month, it might look like a better fit. So sometimes that right there is your first conversation. And it can be that partnership conversation where we really are gonna be willing to give you some, some real feedback on what, what's gonna make this a better fit and what's not. And then I would also say throughout the process, if you do get invited to do an application, don't panic from the Cleveland Foundation's perspective. One foundation, you've met one foundation, right? So from the Cleveland Foundation perspective, we don't do site visits for everything. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I don't always do an in-person meeting. Sometimes I do a phone call. Sometimes people panic and they're like desperately trying to get me to come out to site visit. Um, just because I'm setting up a phone call doesn't mean that it's not looking good. It might just be, I'm, I'm with you, I get it. I just need to clarify some things over the phone. So don't panic, have a conversation with your, your program officer, truly think of them as a partner and educate them. So if you've got someone coming out for a site visit and it is not appropriate for you to have clients there, if you feel like that is not appropriate, tell the foundation and explain to them why. So have a real honest conversation with your program officer. So thank you panel for, for being open and transparent and starting a dialogue with the community. And thank you all for participating and engaging in dialogue. And I'm gonna pass it back to Ryan to take us to the next part of the day. Thank you all. You're welcome. Let's give one more big round of applause for our panelists and our moderator, Carrie Miller. <laughs>